I can't say what I hope that we find because I don't know, but I just hope that this sets a standard that you can do science that is looking into phenomena, whatever that phenomena may be. And I think that's one of the ways we can, uh, at least as young people, like help this discussion is to just talk about it more and do it in a sense that isn't talking about sci-fi movies, but actually talking about people's jobs and, and how they're engaging with it. Welcome to Merge. I'm Ryan Graves. Today, we're joined by Abby White. Abby is a research fellow with the Galileo Project at the Harvard and Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Today, we'll explore her early involvement in this field and her work at the Galileo Project. I hope you enjoy this episode of the Merge podcast. Now, Abby White. All right, Abby, thank you for joining me today. Sure, thanks for having me. <laughs> so I understand you are a fellow at the Galileo project. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Awesome. Well, before we get into that, maybe you could tell us a little bit about um, your background, uh, your educational background and where you grew up and kind of what took you up to being part of that project, that effort. Sure, absolutely. So um, I grew up in a small town in Pennsylvania called Why Missing. Uh, if you're a Taylor Swift fan, you, you would recognize that, that that's where Taylor Swift is from oh. before she moved to Nashville. Uh, so I spent, you know, most of my life there. Uh, for college, I wanted to experiment, go to a new city, do something fun. So I went up to uh, Wellesley College, which is 12 miles west of Boston. And that's where I completed my undergraduate education. So I was there for four years. Um, my my decisions about, you know, pursuing different academic areas changed a lot while I was there. Not too much, but um, so I arrived and I knew I wanted to study math. I always loved math, uh, but, you know... The math major was pretty short and I, you know, was ambitious. I wanted to try something else as well. Uh, Wellesley is a historically women's college and a liberal arts institution. So what that means is you basically are encouraged or actually you have to uh, take a bunch of different classes for distribution requirements so that, you know, your learning is is really rounded out and well-rounded. So I, uh, as for that reason, I had to take a science class. And in high school, I don't know, science just didn't do it for me. I actually hated physics. I wanted nothing to do with it. Um, and I love math. I know, but I loved math. So I was like, oh, give me equations. That's fine. But I just, I don't know. I wasn't into it. Uh, and I didn't have any good reason why. I just didn't, didn't feel like it. Uh, so then I was kind of dreading the science requirement at Wellesley. Um, and I was looking around the course browser and I saw there was astronomy. And I just thought, oh my gosh, this is so cool. When will I ever have the chance to, uh, you know, look through a telescope? We have a couple of different domes with def different telescopes. So I thought, you know, this would just be an amazing way to see a new part of campus and, you know, do something that's science, but maybe not purely some other areas where I just didn't, wasn't drawn to in high school. Not ready so. to commit your life to it quite at that point. Yeah, exactly. So I just take the class, you know, thinking nothing of it, signing up for it. I went through the entire class, had a great time, but, you know, again, like didn't think much of it uh, until about a year later. I, I was really into math and computer science, but then I started thinking about career paths, you know, after college. And I was like, I don't really want to be a software engineer. Like, I don't want to sit at my computer all day and just write code. Uh, but I also, you know, don't want to be stuck in a room by myself writing proofs. Not that that's what mathematicians do. Uh, but in my mind, I was like, OK, I like these two things, but I just don't. There's no career that is combining these two, you know, areas that it's in a way that I think is really cool and I'm really excited about. So then I thought back to this astronomy class and I was like, OK, well, I did a lot of math in that class and I know astronomers code. So maybe I should, you know, take another class. So I had this thought, I signed up for a physics class, you know, which I was nervous <laughs> for, uh, but I ended up just loving it. I think taking that class in the historical women's college environment was what made it so different. Mm. So, you know, prior to that in high school, I was one of the only girls in my, you know, math and, and science courses. Uh, and I went to public high school. So, you know, there was, you know, not tons, tons of resources to, you know, engage specifically like girls in STEM. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I think just being in that atmosphere, you know, I was so encouraged to make mistakes and not be afraid to like raise my hand and ask questions. Um, I could do the homework without being ridiculed for being like a nerd. Uh, so I just I loved it for that reason. And then do you feel uh, like if I may interrupt, yeah. do you feel like when you were at, you know, the educational facility, you said that was the high school uh, you're at and it was mostly uh, mostly boys in that type of STEM education it would that lead you to being more uncomfortable to kind of raising your hand and asking those questions because oh, of that yeah. dynamic just because you're afraid to fail or just didn't want to I don't know what... yeah so I guess I have like specific memories of being in like my AP calculus course mm -hmm. and 
the most of the girls like sat at the front of the classroom and then there was like almost a peanut gallery of guys that would sit in the back of the classroom and i specifically remember like i would do the homework assignments because well for ap courses you're paying to take the exam to get college credit so i was like well if i'm paying to be here you know i, I want to make the most out of it so i would do the homework as one does and uh, i would ask questions about the homework every that's how class started the the teacher uh would always open with you know does anyone have any questions about the homework and i always did <laughs> uh, so every time I'd raise my hand, it would, there someone would make a comment or something from the back of the classroom and kind of just say, like, we get it, you did the homework or, like, mm -hmm. whatever, like, let's move on to class. Mm -hmm. And I think that just really, you know, maybe subconsciously kind of contributed to me, you know, I'd sit in class and think, okay, I've asked this many questions today, I don't want to ask any more, so, you know, I've reached my quota, mm -hmm. which is just, that's so unfortunate because, you know, everyone should be encouraged to learn and ask questions if they don't understand something. Uh, so... I guess that's... At least when you were at Wellesley, you seemed to be surrounded by people that were, you know, interest, also engaged in what they were learning on, on the science side or yeah. because it was a little arts college, mm -hmm. did, was it more kind of a spectator sport there, the science? Yeah, I think it depended on which courses you were in, you know. So when you're taking these introductory courses, there'd be people who were, you know, pre-med uh, or, or, or who were humanities majors mm -hmm. and, you know, had no intention of pursuing it after. But I think that made for a really dynamic classroom because everyone has something different to offer and different mm -hmm. skill sets. So having all those different opinions and, and viewpoints in one room, I think, just made it like an amazing experience. Cool. So, yeah. And so you seem to kind of enjoy that experience then yes you you stuck with yeah it yeah that. so i guess i never finished the story but um so i was in this physics class and i was actually in this class when i got the email everyone that was in college during uh march 2020 knows what uh, i'm referring to the email that we're being sent home uh, and are not COVID. returning for yeah covid we're not, not returning for the spring semester so everyone is shocked we stop class and we're like okay if you want to leave go ahead <laughs> like if you need to process this in your own way so COVID happens, you know, I head back home. My family had moved to Savannah, Georgia at this point, and that's where we are now. Um, so I went back to Georgia and I just did a lot of like inward reflection um, and just thinking about, again, like post-grad, what do I want to do? Uh, you know, I don't come from a family of scientists, so I didn't really know what was out there in terms of like science opportunities or what even like PhD programs or graduate school looked like. I really had no exposure to that. Uh, but anyway, on a whim, I signed up to take observational astronomy. And this gave me the opportunity to, from my bedroom in Georgia, control a telescope, 0.7 meter telescope up at Wellesley. And that just like blew my mind. So I think probably within days after, you know, imaging some star clusters, I declared a second major and just said, you know, it's my junior fall. I got two years. Uh, let's just, you know, pedal to the metal. Let's get this done. So at that point, it just became a race to finish as many, you know, requirements as I could um, and just do, do as much research as I possibly could. Because I, I wasn't the girl who was you know, looking up at the stars when I was really young and thinking, oh, I wonder what's out there. And, and I just wasn't a space kid. Mm -hmm. I didn't watch Star Wars or Star Trek or any of that. I just kind of fell into it very accidentally. Uh, but yeah, that's that's how I ended up at Astro. Uh, but I guess then comes the Galileo Project, mm -hmm. which I think is a, a fun story. So that uh, it was my senior spring. And, uh, you know, so last semester, nearing the end, it's in sight. And I have a, a professor who um, I'm very close with and or close. He was an academic, very important academic mentor for me. Um, and he approached me and he said, I have an opportunity to do an independent study, which basically just meant, you know, I get to control the terms of the project and I can do it at my own pace and then, you know, produce some kind of written report at the end, summarizing everything I've learned. Uh, and he approaches me and he says, oh, would you like to do an independent study on exotic solar system ices? And I'm thinking... I where did this come from? <laughs> I have, you know, I took planetary science with him, but I didn't have too much experience with chemistry or anything. But I was like, OK, I, you know, I really look up to him and I would love to work with him, you know, on a independent study and, you know, really improve my ability to do science by myself and not just, you know, doing problem sets and taking. Was exams. this in line with what you were doing in the undercourse as the observational astronomy, was it related to that or was it a different subset of astronomy? Oh, I, I think it was a different subset. So it definitely leaned more like planetary science. Mm -hmm. So I was looking more at uh, something called spectroscopy of ices. So looking at uh, what they look like in, in that area uh, of science. So it wasn't, I wasn't looking at like stars and, and galaxies yeah. and whatnot. It was more at like uh, objects. Open range? Yeah. So I guess it was um, like comets and asteroids yeah. is really kind of where it falls. So... I started doing this independent study and my professor is like, okay, uh, and actually in a different class, 
with this professor, uh, he starts talking about the Galileo Project and uh, how it was kind of sparked by this uh, object that was observed in 2017 called Oumuamua. I'm not sure. Have you heard of it? I have. Yes. Yeah. So it's an object that, that flew by interstellar object um, that they didn't really know what it was. They, you know, there's different hypotheses out there, you know, nitrogen iceberg, hydrogen iceberg. Um, and then there's this other hypothesis, which is, was presented by uh, Dr. Avi Loeb at Harvard. And he claimed that maybe this object could be uh, a remnant of, you know, an extraterrestrial civilization, like basically space junk that is from another uh, system that flew by our solar system and we observed it. Just because there are a couple properties that were just like weird about it. What properties? Yeah, I think um, there were there was non-gravitational acceleration when it ran around the sun. So no, like it basically had a kick, I believe, in its in its speed. Uh, but so as it was going around the sun or near the sun, you would expect it to accelerate due to the gravity, but it right. was accelerating, but it was accelerating faster than what you would expect. Is that yeah, it? exactly. So it kind of it was almost like a kick. Like it, mm -hmm. I think, to my understanding, from what I recall of that. Um, and it, it had no tail, cometary tail. So when you see a comet, usually it's tail that's coming from, uh, as it gets closer to the sun, it's, you know, heating up and, uh, the ice starts to turn into gas through a process called sublimation. Uh, and you know, there's no tail. So I was like, okay, well, we can't call this thing a comet cause it doesn't have a tail. Um, and it experiences kind of, you know, non-gravitational acceleration. So what could this thing be? Um, and I think, you know, Avi got a lot of criticism for that hypothesis, but it's like, we didn't have enough data to say if it was true or not. Um, but anyway, so then that's basically what my research was without me knowing. It was related to the Galileo project and, and one of their uh, other branches, which is, you know, looking at interstellar objects and their origins. Okay. So that's that's how I fell into it. It's so, a long story. <laughs> so, yeah. So your, your professor at Wellesley brought you into a project studying... Uh, ice fragments within the solar system, which typically gets classified as, as comets or yeah, or asteroids. asteroids. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and in this particular case, there was an interesting comet or asteroid or something else that everyone assumed was a a comet, but it didn't have the characteristic um, exactly. Yeah, the characteristics of of one and performed some interesting things. So yeah, that was your introduction to a very cool yes. Um, <laughs> So how so that was your introduction to what it was? Yes. Um, what what did you think when you when you heard that? Was this something you're like, okay, yeah, that makes sense, or was it? Did you kind of have to step back and kind of reevaluate what you were what you were being offered in a sense to to study? Yeah, I mean, I think I basically signed up to do the independent study uh, so early that when I actually found out what it was about, it was it was pretty much too late <laughs> for me to, to make any <laughs> other decision. Yeah. But I was fine with that. You know, I was like, this is my senior spring. Like, I'm not going to get these chances to engage in this kind of research again. Uh, and even so, the research is, is valuable for many other applications. Uh, so basically what I was doing, and actually there's a paper from the Galileo Project that's coming out uh, this spring. I don't know exactly when um, about this, but it was accepted. So that's exciting. Um, I'm one of the co-authors on it, so it's cool. Uh, thank you. But it's about, you know, physical considerations that we would take if we would want to rendezvous with a interstellar object that was coming by. So the first question is, well, how do you determine that something is weird? So, uh, you know, if we can look at something using spectroscopy and say, oh, well, this is made of water and carbon and, you know, hydrogen. Okay, well, that's probably not super interesting to us we've seen things like this it's probably just you know a comet sure. so that in that case we wouldn't want to rendezvous but in the case of the muamua what would have been awesome is if we had something saying hey this thing is weird for xyz reason let's go out to it and investigate it so we'd send something out there to fly by with it rendezvous Before maybe get some close-up imagery or take some other uh, measurements of the object and then we could better understand what the thing was because that's the thing about muamua we just didn't have enough information to, you know say what it was or we didn't have you know modeling that would allow us to come to a definite conclusion so it kind of just remains this like open question and it flew away from us so we're not ever going to catch up to it again so. why is it so difficult to to either find or to rendezvous with these i mean they're flying at just like really insanely high speeds so um i think i don't know the exact speeds part of me thinks maybe 10 kilometers a second but so I it's kind of like a bullet know. coming into the solar system oh, yeah. from it's somewhere else. Oh, yeah. It's flying so fast. Okay. So it's on like so, a totally different scale of the planets, things of that nature. Right. It's not in this nice orbit, this stable orbit around the sun. Like everything's moving. It's coming in. And, you know, maybe it flies by Jupiter and it might, you know, Jupiter has 
a large mass, so it's going to change. Uh, it's going to influence it with gravity, and it might change trajectories and everything. So it's really hard to. I mean, we have good models for how when things are coming in, where to predict that they're going to end up. But um, you know, in terms of like, it's it's hard to to pinpoint where something's going in. Have you know something out in space that's going to fly to it, mm -hmm. uh, just because it's moving so fast. Uh, and it just costs a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So, but we've done that with other comets, correct? Yeah, or there was, I think, recently uh, something demonstrated. It was it was for more uh, national. I guess you would call it national security. I don't know what what the official term would be, uh, but a group kind of flew out a a probe or something of nature to smash into an asteroid to change its direction. Mm -hmm. Of course, so we want to smash into the thing. Uh, unless it's coming at us, then uh, we definitely want to do that. <laughs> but this would more just be like a flyby, let's get some imagery or maybe close-up mm. spectroscopy or other things of that nature about this object, just so we can say more, because we just don't have enough data to describe And they're it. moving so fast, we would either need to have things out there ready to intercept, or we'd have to detect it at an early enough uh, position to send something out. Exactly. So it's it's kind of like that. It's, it's a give and take. So you want to have uh, maybe some facilities on Earth, that are, you know, looking uh, like the Varese Rubin Observatory that are like looking for these objects in the sky. And maybe once you see one and observe one, you're like, OK, well, we maybe have this uh, some kind of probe or something out in space in a stable orbit uh, waiting for a green light. And it's like, OK, I'm waiting for this on on Earth observatory to signal that this thing is weird. Once that happens, we can say, OK, go ahead, fly. So it's, you know, it's really hard to determine that, you know, an certain things about an object when it's so far away. So that's why we lean to spectroscopy because it is one of those things that we can see. Um, and that basically just- At distance. Yeah, exactly. It's something you can measure with distance and it just gives you signatures um, of, of, you know, different uh, wavelengths and you can see absorption and emission lines and then determine based on our research in labs, those are consistent usually uh, whether you observe them on earth or out in space so you can see, okay. This, uh, we know if there's a dip here, this means that this is the composition. Uh, so it. I think they're starting to do that now with JWST and exoplanet atmospheres. James Webb. So James Webb Space mm -hmm. Telescope, yes. So Very good. Yeah. That's fascinating. <laughs> uh, what are we using to detect these smaller objects before they get in the solar system if we can? Do we have that capability yet or do we have to wait for them to get closer and then we find them and we can figure out they came from external to our solar system after the fact? Yeah, so I actually don't know too much about that uh, myself, but I know, like, for instance, another aspect of the Galileo project, uh, another branch along still still working towards that interstellar object origins kind of mm -hmm. research goal um, is they have an expedition going out to Papua New Guinea that's looking to retrieve fragments of an interstellar object. So uh, that, for instance, they were able to track that trajectory and then based on its trajectory, determine, OK, this did not come from our solar system. So I think that's just like theoretical physics, you know, calculating trajectories. Um, but at that point, I think you have to wait till it's close enough that we can, you know, resolve it and see it in mm -hmm. the sky with our telescopes. And I mean, telescopes are getting better every year. So as we get more and more telescopes or even things out into space, you know, you don't have to fight the atmosphere when you're observing, you know, you're not uh, inhibited by a cloudy night per mm -hmm. se. So, you know, as as you know, even more as like private space companies come into the sphere, I don't know how open they are with their data, but uh, you know, as we get more or this, as these technologies develop, and as we just get simply more of them, uh, there'll be more eyes on the sky. So, um, well, one of the things I understand that uh, for the for the object um, that is in the ocean that the Galileo project or um, Doctor uh, Ivy Loeb was talking about going and investigating, um, they had. Uh, they had a supposition about that particular object and they were waiting for additional data from uh, classified systems to confirm mm -hmm. uh, whether or not the trajectory was truly extrasolar. Right. That's my understanding. Can you speak to that at all? Yeah, I wish I could speak more to it. I'm actually, that's w the one branch that I haven't really, you know, mm -hmm. been involved with too much. But I know, I think they were able to, there was some calculation that they were doing where they were just trying to pinpoint like where exactly it was. Um, and I think they were waiting on information there because mm -hmm. uh, the government had tracked it because, you know, if something's flying into the earth, you, the government's on it. <laughs> uh, so since it was the ocean, you know, it wasn't a threat or anything. But uh, they were trying to, you know, pinpoint that location. Uh, and I think they're waiting for more data for that front. But uh, I think they were able to make progress with their calculations or something to improve the resolution. But that's that's as far as I know. Yeah, I think I remember them being a little bit frustrated, I guess, with the fact that they were trying to do this for science and, you know, the government wasn't necessarily cooperating, but they have their reasons and, and we have ours. So, 
Yeah, you know, it's uh, it's a trend that I've seen, and it's not necessarily uh, a negative thing. Um, we put a lot of money and effort into developing weapons and systems and sensors uh, within the government, and those things typically um, we like to hide how well they work, obviously, yeah. from our adversaries. Exactly, yeah. And so, you know, this is, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean the information that is captured is classified, but just the fact that you could detect something at a particular exactly. range or know the size or the resolution. Um, and that's what we see a lot in um, the unidentified anomalous phenomenon area. Um, when I was flying, we were seeing objects on the radar. The objects themselves weren't necessarily classified. Uh, at least no one told me that. Mm -hmm. um, but the systems we were capturing it on, such, right. such as the radars and everything else, were classified. Um, in the Galileo project now, you know, I believe one of their taglines is that the sky is not classified. Yeah. <laughs> um, but maybe you can talk about what their goals are now and how they're trying to essentially gather data outside the realm of, of government oversight. Sure. So at a high level, I would say the goal of the Galileo project is to bring the search for signatures of extraterrestrial civilizations to a standard where there is rigorous scientific investigation and there are, you know, credible instruments and people behind these discoveries, basically bringing science to the conversation, because mm -hmm. uh, I think that's something that's been perhaps missing uh, in in recent history. So, I mean, why do you I, think that is? I wish I knew. It's it's hard for me to imagine that because I think, you know. Most people I talk to, even friends, colleagues, family, uh, are so interested in the subject and they're like, yeah, totally, like we should look at something. We don't understand it. Um, and I think the only thing that that I can justify this with is just that it it makes people and authority uncomfortable. So I guess what I mean by that is, and I guess we've seen this kind of in different cases in a little bit different ways. So. With astronomy, there is like dark matter and dark energy. This has, you know, been shown to make up a vast majority of our universe. But scientists really don't know what's going on with it. That's why we call it dark matter and dark energy. Because we're like, oh, it's dark. We don't know what it is. Uh, so there's a whole study about like trying to figure out what exactly that is. Um, and for some reason, that is fine to do. You know, when we don't understand something, okay, let's look into it. But when it comes to UAP, that same logic isn't applied. And I think this kind of has to play into what I might foresee as a paradigm shift occurring in the future if we would make more progress. So what I mean by that, um, a paradigm is basically a belief system or theory that provides like a unifying explanation for a set of phenomena mm -hmm. or, you know, in, in some field. So a set of phenomena in some field. And it usually also suggests methods for which uh, ideas are tested or knowledge is advanced. So uh, paradigms, you know, are upheld in numerous ways, uh, one being the power of authority, right? So if the authority figures are kind of speaking this paradigm and, and you know, people are buying into it, that, you know, people aren't going to go against authority for many, for many and various reasons. Uh, so that keeps paradigms in place. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have the human experience. We're imperfect. So you're going to have, uh, you know, people are irrational sometimes. We are emotionally attached to certain ideas. We also have, you know, de denialism when it comes with coping with cognitive dissonance. Uh, and then we also, you know, have this taboo stigma and ridicule that comes with ideas that are outside of these paradigms. So I think two examples that, you know, we've seen in what I might say is recent history um, are like heliocentrism and germ theory. So heliocentrism is the idea that the sun is at the center of the universe, or sorry, not the universe, the solar system. Sun is at the center of the solar system. And this was not agreed upon for, you know, a long time. They thought, you know, the Earth was the center of everything and everything was rotated around us. Mm -hmm. uh, but actually, this is where the Galileo project got our name from. Uh, Galileo uh, used his telescope to make observations to find direct evidence that was disproving this, this idea that the Earth was at the center of the solar system. paradigm. Yeah, exactly. So people refused to look through his telescope. Because they were either freaked out, authority figures were like, well, we don't want to deal with the aftermath, you know, of a paradigm shift because, you know, people, who knows what that's going to do to disrupt the status quo. Yes, exactly. Disrupt the status quo. So people refused to look through his telescope. And then eventually, you know, more and more people just came out with this and they're like, guys, this just doesn't make sense. 
Uh, so they're like, okay, we're going to throw that whole Earth-centric theory out, and now we've adopted heliocentrism. And now, you know, people in our age, oh, yeah, sun's the center of the solar system. We'd never doubt it. Mm -hmm. And that just had to come along with time. Uh, and then germ theory, which I don't know too much about. I'm not <laughs> in the medical field, but I think it's the idea that um, certain diseases are caused by, like, microorganisms invading the body. So that was something that wasn't, you know, necessarily agreed upon. It was controversial. That, it was controversial, yeah. So it's like you don't get scarlet letter stamped with a disease. It's like, oh, there are actually things that can, like, just make you sick. Uh, and then you can pass it to one another in, in that way. So it's funny to think about those things. I'm like, oh, that's so insane. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think, you know, dare I say we may be on the verge of something, whether it comes to, you know, dark matter, dark energy, quantum mechanics, all of that, there might be a paradigm shift and that's going to happen with that. Uh, but even UIP, I think, I think to answer your question, that is why um, it hasn't received the scientific attention is because it's, it's scary. People are scared of it. Mm, it is. Yeah. And I think it also, um, even perhaps more so than, um, heliocentricity, uh, directly attacks our kind of high status as, um, you know, our our only inhabitants of this universe in a sense, right? It directly challenges our our place there. Um, our heliocentricity. Wait, that's the right word. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> heliocentrism or whatever. Yeah, um, <laughs> heliocentrism redefines our place in the universe, but yeah, this really defines our you know our position yeah. of ourselves within the universe. Exactly. Um, yeah. And it, yeah, that can be scary. That yeah. can be scary. Do you think science? Do you think science can overcome that just with data, or do you think there's going to be other, you know, sociological, um, I don't even know what the right word is, tools or, you know, things that we need to do to move people past this barrier, or is it truly, do you think, just about data and communication? Yeah, I mean, I don't think that you can kind of have one of those things without the other. So your science is nothing if you can't communicate it. Mm -hmm. So... And that goes for all sciences. Do you think that's going to be enough, though, for some people to see Yeah, no, I don't I don't think so. I, I really don't think so, which is unfortunate. I mean, me as a scientist, I'm like, yeah, show me the data. Like, that's mm -hmm. good for me. But I know not everyone's like that. Um, some people, I think, if you don't have a, sight, a sighting story, you know, you might not be within the, the UAP community might be like, oh, well, you don't really, you haven't seen it. You're not really one of us. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't experienced that, but I can imagine that that might be the kind of mentality that some people have with it. Um, again, I haven't experienced that, so... Uh, I can't say for sure, but I do think, you know, that's why the Galileo Project, we have a societal implications group. And, you know, those are philosophers, social scientists who are just really thinking about, you know, once we publish papers and are getting data, how is that, how are we going to communicate that? And how is that going to impact, you know, society as a whole? Oh, that sounds fascinating. Yeah. When do you guys have papers coming out in that direction? Um, I'm not sure, actually. I think uh, we have one, two papers that are kind of, you know, higher level, and I'm I'm hoping they... Well, I, I've read them. I think they're, you know, people can engage with them. You don't have to have necessarily like a rigorous scientific mm -hmm. background. Uh, but one of them is about, you know, just an overview of the project. And then that one's written by Dr. Avi Loeb. And then there's another paper written by Dr. Wes Waters at Wellesley College that is just giving kind of the history of, of UAP studies and, and outlining our approach as well and, and how we fit into that. Awesome. Very interesting. Yeah. So speaking of how you fit in, what about yourself? So what what is specifically you're doing to help the Galileo Project now? What is your title within that effort? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I talked a little bit about kind of the two other branches, but the one that's most relevant to this podcast is the UAP branch. So uh, that's definitely, uh, you know, where I spend most of my time now. So within that effort, I'm working on instrumentation. So I'm on the ground building things, you know, troubleshooting hardware, debugging, all that fun stuff. Um, and I started that. Uh, four days after graduating, actually, from undergrad at Wellesley. Wow. I uh, just went right into it. And I started off just as, like, a summer research fellow. So my time was supposed to be 50% with Wellesley and 50% with Harvard. Um, I should also mention that Wellesley has a smaller subgroup within the Galileo Project related. They call themselves Celeste, which is Galileo's daughter's name, oh. which makes sense. <laughs> uh, so they have a smaller group working there as well uh, because within this UAP, you know, goal, we have an observatory class system. That's, you know, what I work with now. That's your, like, about on the scale of $250,000. Um, and then we have, uh, you know, one level below that, order of magnitude below that, and that's what Wellesley is working on. So they're, you know, aiming for about $25,000, kind of like a rack mount. Uh, oh, I should mention, sorry, I should say. So you have the observatory class system, about $250,000. Uh, that's, you know, what I work with most. And then we also have Wellesley's system, which is a level below that. 
that's twenty five thousand dollars. It's a non weatherized system, but it gives you, you know, enough things that, you know, we still have some IR cameras, we have a microphone. It's just maybe not as expensive as, you know, the highest level. Mm -hmm. um, and then below that we have like a rack mount system and that we're aiming for about like uh two thousand five hundred dollars. So that's kind of like our our three tiered approach because, you know, we can't expect to uh, everyone to have, oh, okay, yeah, I have a uh, quarter of a million dollars to give. Let me just <laughs> have this observatory class system on my roof. Mm -hmm. um, not everyone has a roof that, you know, has something that big. So, you know, we kind of make these different levels so that we can engage uh, in the best way possible, especially, you know, if there's an area where, you know, sightings start to pop up, we can bring the, the rack mount system or the Wellesley system that's non-weatherized and just kind of set it up temporarily and just get some data. So that's kind of the reasoning behind those three. But yeah, just working on instrumentation and supporting the group. So I don't really have a fancy name. I'm just a research fellow, but. <laughs> what kind of instruments are on, let's say maybe the, the largest one there? I assume that has the most sensors. I could be wrong. But... Yeah, exactly. It has the most sensors. Um, what are you looking for? Yeah, I feel like we're just casting a wide net because we don't really know what to look for. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to cover all bases. So let's see if I can list all of them. Uh, so <laughs> we have an audio system that's recording, you know, audible range, but also infrasound and ultrasound range. Then we have an infrared camera system, and that's uh, made up. It kind of looks like, uh, it's called the Dalek. We call it Dalek. Kind of maybe looks like R2-D2. Uh, you'll see pictures in, in the papers, and they're probably, if you go on the Galileo Project website, you can see videos of our instrumentation, um, or some of it at least. So that's one that's on there. And that is made up of some boson cameras and infrared around the base, um, and then one on the top that's looking, you know, at the zenith kind of area location, which is like right above head, overhead. Um, and What's then- a boson detector? Oh, it's just, it's a type of camera. Got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's like a, a company, I think. Very good. Uh, yeah. Uh, so then we also have a visible camera. So that's like if you sat with your eyes and looked up the sky, but in higher resolution, uh, I'm kind of blind, so I would not uh, see as well as this camera would, but that's like 4K resolution. Um, and then we also have a tracking camera. So those are going to talk to each other. So that tracking camera is actually, it's, um, it's a security camera, but, you know, we're using it for... <laughs> not security purposes uh so it just security. goes exactly yeah exactly uh so if the infrared cameras see something interesting if our ai algorithms you know say okay hey this thing is weird uh again that whole question of how do you determine what is weird comes up again that's something we have to revisit and talk about a lot mm -hmm. um then the the camera is going to track point to it and then zoom in and try to get higher resolution than maybe our infrared cameras would mm -hmm. um let's see what else we have a spectrum analyzer we have a magnetometer. We also have, uh, we're working on a passive radar solution because we can't have the, the beautiful radar that, that you guys have. Uh, and the reason we're trying to do that passively is so that we can uh, more easily uh, set up our system and not influence you know, areas around us. It's hard if you're emitting radio signals, that's, uh, it's very hard to get approval and everything for that. Yeah, uh, yeah exactly. So if you're passive, you're just sitting there so it's it's you know that technology is really cool but it's still developing so uh very early stages of that but i think oh we also have a weather station that's really important because you need to monitor atmospheric conditions because we don't know these phenomena could also be you know related to weather as well mm. so i think we're just trying to do everything you know making no assumptions about what's already out there um which it, it's pretty hard because usually the way science is done is that you maybe have a hypothesis or some kind of ideas that are, you know, maybe gently guiding you to a solution. You're like, okay, well, I know I have to work within this framework or try to answer these questions. Um, but we don't really have anything to go off of, uh, at least from a scientific point. You know, a big, a big thing was, you know, do we take into account uh, people like witness accounts? Mm -hmm. Is that something we can use scientifically to justify why we're going to this place or why we have this instrument or that instrument? Uh, so it gets kind of sticky. It's it's hard to uh, to do it because then it's like you don't want to ignore the witness accounts either. Uh, but you know, trying to to set the standard for what the science approach, scientific approach for UAP is like, is you know not something that's super trivial. Mm -hmm. So I think just casting a wide net, letting letting the data speak for itself, and you know, telling us what's interesting and what's not interesting. That that's interesting too. Is like if if the audio and cameras are going off crazy and Again, what is crazy, I don't know. Um, but if for some reason they're finding signatures that are just bizarre, but we go over maybe to our passive radar or the magnetometer and things look, you know, sound as can be, that's also interesting mm -hmm. because, you know, we might have some kind of phenomena there as well. So that's my long answer to your question. <laughs> Does science work like that in other fields or in other examples? 
I don't know if I know. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I guess, thinking about like computer science, I think uh, with AI, the whole point of AI is to, you know, not have humans make assumptions, but have the computer kind of make them. And that's definitely what we're relying on in our systems to determine like what is weird. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, we humans shouldn't shouldn't be involved in that. We're heavily biased. Mm -hmm. But computer systems, you know, they do a better job at, at you know, you know, clustering things and, and grouping things and, and just determining outliers. So I, I would say, you know, in statistics, of course, you always uh, are looking at data sets and, and determining outliers. So in that sense, I think maybe it's similar but the whole approach of you know having to uh you know, if you only have witness accounts i can't really think of any other science maybe where it's like that but there's probably something i wonder if you could yeah if you had a large enough data set you know perhaps pull out um pull out some data using machine learning that was consistent across all the cases that other mice might not be detected yeah yeah do you think that's happening or is that happening? Um, do you know if that's happening uh, in the wider astronomy field for signal detection uh, within the data sets that we're receiving, I'll say, from further away? Yeah, I don't know. I think that'd be a question. I wish I knew more about like the SETI Institute, for instance, because I know like they're looking at techno signatures um, and I'm sure they have you know, things that they're using to determine, you know, if something is worth looking into more. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I don't, I don't really know enough to speak about it. One of the one of the reasons I ask you that is because um, I think I've I've read some articles about that, and of course, the further away you get from Earth, it seems, uh, or from us, the more comfortable we are looking for life elsewhere. The more mm. scientifically acceptable it is. Why do you think that is? I don't know. I would love to read those papers if you remember what they are. I don't sure. think I've come across them, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think like the universe is really big, so sometimes we have to look really far to uh, to try to see other systems that are like ours. Um, but yeah, it's it is interesting because the the way kind of like light works. So when you're looking farther away, you're also looking further back into time because mm -hmm. uh, you know for non-science people listening <laughs> or watching, um, light has to travel. So if you're looking farther away. That means that the light is going to take more time to get to you. So as you look further and further away, you're like seeing that light. Well, when the light reaches you, you know, that's there was some time that had to pass mm -hmm. when it was being sent. So it's like uh, I think you see this in a lot of James Webb you know, imagery. You see like really red galaxies. So that's something called a redshift. So um, the universe is also expanding. So when that light is traveling, the universe is expanding. It's shifting to redder wavelengths, mm -hmm. uh, which are longer wavelengths, and because it has to cover cover more space, so it's that whole uh, play of of you know space and time. But uh, yeah, I'm forget your original question. That's okay, <laughs> I do that all the time. Uh, but really, you know, we have the SETI, and SETI looks out and looks for distant radio waves, and you know, maybe that just feels safer to us to think that we can look out there and if we find something, it's not immediately threatening. Yeah, okay, I think and I understand your question. Look yeah. at Mars and it's like, maybe there's microbes there, right? And yeah. that's not very yeah, threatening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then when we consider if there's something in our sky that theoretically could potentially be from elsewhere, that's a much more mm -hmm. scary thought, so. Yeah, and also it's scary to think about if there's, or at least I would say it's scary, I don't know if everyone else would, maybe they think it's cool. Uh, that there's other civilizations that are more technologically advanced than we are. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that also, you know, is playing into that whole idea of, again, like paradigms. Um, if you are seeing signatures, you know, maybe, but I guess they, signatures can be threatening words hurt too. Uh, but it's like, do they speak the same language? Like, probably not. Like, how do they communicate? So, um, but yeah, no, I do. Th I do think it's just like, again, it's all, it's also been hard because everything that, you know, like your detectors and everything that you have used or, or seen with, you know, other fighter pilots, that's all like classified. And we're getting kind of these bits from, you know, the government reports that are coming out, but it's not enough for us to like actually scientifically evaluate, you know, the situation. Mm -hmm. So we kind of have to take our own, our own data mm -hmm. to, to figure that part out. And, you know, I know that can, that leads to people's ability to kind of push back and say this is silly and or nonsense or try to, you know, discourage you perhaps from uh, engaging in this field. So, you know, as you were considering kind of engaging in the Galileo project, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you said you didn't really necessarily know what you're getting into, but now <laughs> here you are, you know, on my podcast talking about it. Yeah. So um, what what has been, you know, you made a decision to kind of kind of lean into this a bit. Mm, yeah. Um, 
did anyone have any conversations with you and discuss, you know, potentially what the implications of that could be, or was there any pushback or your experiences kind of diving into this? Yeah, no, I think that's something I'd love to talk about because I'm sure now as, you know, more people are, are coming into this field, it's something they may be thinking about or, or, or considering, you know, as reasons for them not to get involved. Mm. Um, I don't think I ever received any like official warnings or, you know, anything, uh, but it was just kind of unspoken. Like, okay, uh, I guess I should say, so I was doing that independent study and then um, that same, you know, professor is Professor Wes Waters asked, you know, what I like to do with summer research with the Galileo project, you know, working on instrumentation. So switching branches, but still under the same um, umbrella. And, you know, at that point I had, you know, full intentions of applying to grad school that next year. So I was just thinking, you know, I mean, I did think about it. I was thinking, okay, is my involvement, how is this, how is my involvement going to be received from people who are maybe viewing my application for grad school? Um, and I definitely had to take, take a little bit of time to, you know, think about that and, you know, weigh pros and cons. Because uh, I think it'd be silly to say like, oh, I don't care. It, it'll be fine. But if you kind of make this decision, you might be uh, affected for your career. Uh, or at least that's that's what I was telling myself. Uh, but eventually I, I was looking at the project and, you know, my experiences up until then had been no different than any other research, astronomy research experiences. Like the previous summer I was at Cornell working on instrumentation for, that's going to look at, uh, it's like cosmology instrumentation. So it didn't feel, the atmosphere didn't feel any different than that. So I was like, okay, well, as long as I can explain myself and, you know, the things that I'm doing are very fundamental, they're scientific, I'm, I'm developing skills in hardware, coding, debugging, all of that, and that's going to be really helpful. Um, so I just kind of thought, okay, it's going to be about framing moving forward. But also, if I'm applying to these institutions and they're going to judge me for engaging in this topic, even though it's with the proper methodology or great methodology, that's probably not a place I want to be anyway. So I'll go ahead and let them filter themselves out because uh, I don't I don't want to go to a place and and be surrounded by people who are not uh, encouraging of, you know, scientific processes. Because, again, it's like nothing that we're doing is, is maybe different mm -hmm. um, in terms of our like our science goals you know we follow all the same processes that you would if you were working on another scientific project because just it's the just application is a little target, different yeah. yeah the application is a little different the target's different but you know who cares mm -hmm. so that's kind of i just was like you know i'm gonna lean into it um and you know i i really i've never received any pushback um we were speaking a little earlier I applied to grad school. I've been admitted to, you know, multiple places. So it seems like it's it's been well received. And um, I think that fear I had in my head was totally like self-advocated. Yeah. Um, and I think the people that maybe do think that way, maybe they just stay quiet, mm -hmm. which, uh, you know, that's fine. But I, I really do think that over time it's going to change a lot. I mean, just like talking about it to my friends uh, and family, like they're all just so excited to hear about what's going on and, you know, I've been really able to bond with a lot of my family members. Like my um, my grandfather uh, or my great grandfather was uh, worked on planes in World War II. Cool. Um, so uh, like I feel like in some ways I'm kind of you know engaging with that side of my family, and you know they've been interested in the topic for reasons because I think it kind of started out in like a, a military kind of perspective, and it's cool that what science, started out with the military perspective or a UAP kind of topic. Okay. It's like that's where they started having these uh where they started kind of maybe collecting science or collecting data about these objects uh because before that i think it had m mostly been witness accounts uh, so that's kind of the first time where they were like it's weird because our instruments said mm -hmm. that they were kind of strange um so in some ways like i'm talking to like my grandfather who also you know was was a pilot and i think like talking to him has been has been awesome you know he's just fascinated by it um has he seen so. anything no, no. I wish I wish I had stories, but no, I don't have any. But I think it's just the idea of it, uh, and they're just really excited that you know. I I think the other point I'll make is that I think one of the reasons that the Galileo project has you know gone to where it is now is because of that Harvard name that's attached to it. So I think that has helped give it credibility. Um, 
which, you know, might not have had if it was another institution, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So I definitely, when I was like telling people about my job, I would definitely lean into that first. Like, oh, I'm doing research at Harvard. And I'd be like, okay, maybe they'll ask what I'm doing. Oh, I'm doing instrumentation. Oh, uh, instrumentation. Yeah. For UAP. So I definitely like kind of had, I would approach that in layers for probably the first couple of weeks I was working. Mm -hmm. And then, like I said, I just decided, you know what? I think this is worth speaking about. And I kind of just gained confidence in that, in the mission. Uh, and I was like, okay, we're just going to lead with that. So anytime we're like out with, and I'm meeting new people or acquaintances and I'm with people, for instance, like my roommates who know what I do. Uh, and, you know, people come over, they're like, oh, yeah, what do you do for work? And we all just kind of look at each other and smile because <laughs> we know that my answer is going to kind of blow their mind. Uh, so I've just like leaned into that and it's it's become like really fun. And I think that's one of the ways we can, uh, at least as young people, like bring this uh, or help this discussion is to just talk about it more and, you know, do it in a sense that isn't talking about sci-fi movies, but actually talking about like, you know, people's jobs and, and how they're engaging with it. So, and the science. Yeah. It's incredible. Are you seeing that your friends are much more open to the topic? Yeah, and I think again that kind of plays into like with time. I think it'll 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 change. Uh, but yeah, I haven't ever, to my face at least, <laughs> received any pushback from friends. It's all been like genuine interest. Mm -hmm. That's very cool. Yeah. Uh, among others, um, do you think that this is uh, a field or topic you're going to continue to pursue or? Actually, I'll just stop and say that. <laughs> That's a million dollar question. And Avi wants to know that answer too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, yeah, no, I think like, I don't think I ever want to cold turkey quit my involvement. Um, but I am also interested in other aspects of the universe. So I think I, it just kind of depends on, on what opportunities are out there. Um, again, I've kind of proven that maybe if you work on this in undergrad, it's not going to follow me into grad school. But then, you know, that same question comes up, okay, when I'm in grad school and I'm applying for postdocs or I, I eventually want to be a professor, um, currently it's my, it's my goal, I'll probably change in a few years, I don't know, <laughs> that's, that's for right now. Uh, but then it's like, okay, well that, if I do it in grad school, will that follow me there? Uh, so it's something I have to think about, but you know, there's so many great mentors in the project that I've been able to kind of have these conversations with, mm -hmm. especially when I was applying, just like how do I word things or whatever. And they, they really helped me, uh, with that and, you know, lean into the science aspect of it. Uh, so, but you know, I, I, I can't help, uh, but want to continue doing the work in some capacity. Mm -hmm. So I think it'll just depend on uh, what can I write a thesis about? Cause that does kind of, or dissertation about, yeah. uh, cause it does kind of have to be this uh, package like project that you do. So, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I'm keeping the idea open. I'm, I'm just trying to go into it with an open mind and uh, we'll see, we'll see where that leads me. Awesome. <laughs> what would you recommend to uh, people that were in your shoes a few years ago that are you know, making decisions about where they want to go to school or what they want to study. You know, not saying you have to say you should look into UAP or this, but you know, <laughs> you you basically stuck to your guns and you know had the bravery to have this conversation uh, against you know the popular culture and against um, the skepticism out there. So, you know, what advice or what would you offer to anyone um, younger than you looking into this and going into college? Yeah. I have like so much advice. I feel like so many things I wish I could like, you know, could have told myself. I feel like it's easier to speak to my younger self, so I'll do that. And then if this resonates with anyone, Certainly. that's amazing. Uh, I would just say like, explore as much as you can. Even if you think you know what you want to do, just sign up for that weird class, sign up for something fun uh, that you might not have, have, you might not have any other chance to engage with. And if you like it, even if you're not great at it, just keep trying and keep pursuing it. Uh, and I think that's that's kind of what got me t into astronomy. But even then, when it comes to like graduate school, um, I think, you know, evaluate your goals. And if graduate school fits into them, that's awesome and, and you should pursue it. But uh, by no means, you know, not everything needs to have a, an advanced degree behind it. So even if, you know, if you don't want to go to college, uh, just do find things that you're passionate about and, and try to engage with them. Uh, but also, you know, acknowledge that what your goals are and just try to work towards them. So I think, uh, you know, I wish, I wish I could, could 
go back and tell myself where I am now because I think I would just be utterly shocked. Yeah, um, little Ryan would be shocked. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, when I was eight, I wanted to be on Broadway. <laughs> I'm like, I don't want that anymore. Uh, but I think that's okay. You know, it's okay to like change what you want to do and it's okay to change your mind. Um, and it's okay to, you know, maybe do work that not everyone in your family or in your circle maybe like is going to approve of. Obviously, you know, you should check in with people and make sure that, you know, it's not like uh, anything too wild. But <laughs> <laughs> there are some boundaries. There, there are boundaries. But, you know, when it comes to topics like this that um, have ridicule, like look into why that ridicule is there in the first place mm-hmm. and don't, you know, read a bunch of articles and just conglom- conglomerate their opinions together. Uh, really think about like what your belief system is. So I think that is really important, not worrying about how people are going to perceive it. If you're passionate about something, frame it in a way that it's going to be acceptable to others. And if it's not acceptable to them, maybe take that as a sign that that's not somewhere where you want to be anyway. Mm. That's yeah. great advice. Awesome. So where is the Galileo project today? You know, I, they're, they're building sensors. You're building sensors. You have a couple different types. You have a big expensive one and you're working to bring them the cost down mm-hmm. and make them more scalable. Um, have you guys started like making what I would call like production detections or are you still kind of in a testing phase right now? Yeah. So I would say, you know, straight up, we're definitely in the testing phase right now, uh, but that's the most important phase. So uh, the terminology we've been using is we're in phase one. So we have this, our first observatory system. Uh, we had it installed on top of the uh, Harvard College observatory roof for a while. Uh, we are just, you know, testing that everything, like the hardware is behaving as we're expecting. Um, and then we were able to move to another instrument site, which uh, I'm not allowed to say where. It's but classified. Classified. <laughs> <laughs> but that is where we can, you know, do a little bit more rigorous testing. Um, but yeah, so definitely just like making sure things are, are running. You know, sometimes you need to go out there and uh, unplug some USB cables and replugging them in. So we have to troubleshoot, like, why did that happen? Uh, and thinking about, you know, what that says in terms of our technology capability, how hands off is it, how hands on is it. So just determining all those things mm-hmm. is, is really important in this phase one. Uh, but also, you know, we have a science traceability matrix that says all of our goals, uh, you know, areas where we want to make sure these instruments are performing up to s- their specifications. So just referring back to that always, uh, which that will be in our paper that are our papers that are coming out. Uh, but just referring back to that and making sure, OK, we said we wanted to get this resolution of objects. Uh, we want to be able to see objects moving like this fast or this far away. Uh, just making sure that we're actually seeing that. So and you just, define all those parameters in some of your upcoming papers. Exactly. So those are very, you know, they're detailed and they're lined out, just like they would for any other, you know, mm-hmm. scientific project. So I think that is really important. So we've kind of put a pause, um, or not put a pause. We've just kind of taken this opportunity to uh, now that things are kind of going to make sure we're doing the preliminary analysis and again performing up to spec. So uh, that involves a lot of observing birds and planes <laughs> for right now. But I mean, we have the cameras rolling. So if anything decides to give us a visit, uh, I go. guess we'll have it. But it's just, you know, the like like we were kind of speaking about a little bit, uh, how you determine that something is weird or anomalous. We're going to let the like the AI, AI algorithms handle that for us. Got it. So in order for those, you know, algorithms to operate, they need to have collect large amounts of data first. So they need to see a ton of planes and a ton of birds and a ton of insects uh, just and so that they can cluster them together in groups. And then once that clustering starts to happen, you can kind of see, OK, maybe there's a couple of points that are just hanging out over here. Let's go and see what those are about. And then that's where, you know, we maybe start to uh, go into what we would say like anomaly detection. It. Uh, so it'll be definitely like a continuous process, but I, I would say we're we're definitely in like the testing phase right now. Uh, but, you know, taking all this into consideration and we're hoping soon, uh, you know, I think our, our goal right now is by August where we uh, where we've kind of started the papers, the introductory papers outlining like the hardware of the system and the goals last year uh, to kind of have our first round of papers about like data and our interpretation and, and methodologies there. So definitely stay tuned for that uh but that's in 2024 the fall yeah so i guess depends on on what or journals what journals we submit to and what their processes are like for feedback okay. and then how long they take to publish but i would say hopefully um so it'll be like a well, batch papers come out and then a year later they'll be supplemented with more got it so yeah so 
the papers I don't think are necessarily part of phase one, but uh, that kind of validation and testing that you talked about is phase one. Is phase two more of just kind of the the data collection and waiting to, to catch something, or is that what phase two would be? Yeah, so I should clarify. I guess phase one is is more, uh, the phases is more in reference to like what hardware we're using. Yeah. So phase one includes like the whole process of designing and whatever. So all of our papers that are coming out are about our phase one instrumentation. Got it. So it's outlining, you know, hardware, what we're using, all that. Um, so that, you know, the whole point of this and, and for, you know, good science studies, you want to make sure that your studies are uh, able to be replicated. So we want to outline all the details so that if someone, another group or another university would pick up our paper, follow everything exactly, they would hope to get, you know, the same results that we're getting. That's the whole point um, of, of these papers is to outline, you know, what we're doing, being transparent about it um, as much as we can. Um, and yeah, so... That's kind of phase one. And then we're kind of thinking about, okay, like phase 1.5, maybe we replace. So for instance, one thing we're, we're talking about now is we have um, this Dalla camera, which I was talking about earlier, which is made up of infrared cameras. You know, is it better to have one big one or two smaller ones spaced apart? So things like that, you just have to test and kind of see what happens. Uh, and you can, you know, calculate theory and everything all day, but it really comes down to, you know, when you're out there, what, yeah. are, you getting, what, are, you get, what are you getting and what can you do? So, you know, just making sure our pipelines are, are running smoothly um, and that the hardware is behaving expected, as expected is, is, you know, the highlight of phase one. But uh, for phase two, you know, that's adding a couple uh, instruments. So um, I guess I spoke uh, spoke excitedly. The magnetometer isn't technically part of our, our phase one yet, um, but it's something I work on. So I... I it's in the works, so it's almost like phase 1.5. It's almost like in the middle. But like that, and then we're adding a spectrometer. Uh, so it's just a couple of things that are, are you know, a little bit further uh, further ahead. So that's like kind of phase two will be a, like an upgrade to our systems or thinking about, you know, t again, technology is, is always improving. I'm talking about those infrared cameras. Well, that same company just came out with a plus version. It's more expensive, but it has better resolution and all of this. So it's like, okay, well... You know where do where do our limits lie? Do we need something that's better? Do we not need something that's better? Mm -hmm. So it's just a lot of those like little questions that we're okay. trying to answer right now. So, yeah. so things are progressing as expected. Yeah, you know, people shouldn't be waiting for some massive announcement tomorrow or anything. Yeah, crazy, exactly. But. No, it'll take it'll take a while to get there. Just like I said, because you know, we are trying to do this very rigorously and and scientifically. So even if we see something that doesn't quite make sense, uh, we're gonna wait for our AI algorithm to tell us that, not mm -hmm. just with our eyes. Wait for the so. scientific process. That yeah, exactly, and and making sure uh, you know we're referencing all the other instruments. Uh, you know, like we saw like a a, a a bird fly by that was like in a weird trajectory, and we we're all like, oh, that's so cool and exciting. But it's like, oh yeah, we can see it's a bird. We can hear it's a bird. You know, so it it, uh, it humbles you very yeah. much. Yeah. Uh, and you know, separating that, I think, uh, you know. Not everyone on the team is is you know believing in the same outcome, right? You know there there are some like I guess you would say like non-believers, mm -hmm. um, which I think is important to have on a project like this to make sure you know you're doing it right and you're incorporating everyone's opinions and viewpoints and in, into the uh, approach and discussion. But uh, I mean, I guess I would say I just hope that I can't say what what I hope that we find because I don't know, mm -hmm. but I just hope that this sets a standard that you can do science. That is looking into phenomena, whatever that phenomena may be. Awesome. Well, I'm really happy yeah. you're looking into it and yeah. taking an interest in it. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, thank you for you know bringing this to light. And obviously, it would have never happened without you know the brave the bravery of many people who have had experiences and witness accounts coming forward and and really fighting for this to get the attention I think it deserves. So. Awesome. Well, we'll be watching and good luck. Yay! Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>